If you're someone who deals with anxiety, excessive worry, OCD, have you ever wanted to have a direct conversation with one of the world's leading experts on how to heal it? Well, I have some exciting news for you because that's exactly what we're going to do today. Introducing Dr. Russell Kennedy, or better known as the Anxiety MD, who's here to answer all questions related to anxiety or what he refers to as the body's alarm system. We're going to talk about OCD, hypochondria, and most importantly, how to heal these conditions permanently. During our conversation, Dr. Russ dives deep into the true nature of anxiety, explaining how it gets stored in the body in the first place, why thinking actually makes it worse and doesn't heal it. And one of my favorite takeaways and insights from this is that people with anxiety are often so much stronger than they give themselves credit for. I thoroughly enjoyed my discussion with Dr. Russ, and I'm so confident that you will too. So sit back, relax, get a pen and paper, absorb all of his genius and insights on the possibility of healing your anxiety. Welcome to the Jackie Senatori Show, formerly known as the Extraordinary Living Podcast. I'm your host, of course, Jackie Senatori, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Each week, I'm going to strive to provide you with mindset strategies, how to shift your energy, all to empower you to live a healthier and more fulfilling life. Now, if you're someone that's here that would love to learn how to shift your energy all within a few minutes, meaning when you have an emotion that's charged or you're triggered, or you really just want to get into a stronger and clearer alignment to create a life that you truly love, I have a free resource for you called the Energy Shifter. It's a few minute experience of experiencing what active meditation is like, how to get centered, how to get calm, and most importantly, how to get the wisdom that your current pain or challenge has come to show you. So if that sounds good to you, it's a free resource. Just go to JackieSenatory.com forward slash energy shifter, and then take advantage of this free resource. And let's jump into today's episode. We have Dr. Russell Kennedy here also known as the Anxiety MD. He's a visionary physician in the field of anxiety disorders. He has a diverse background in medicine, neuroscience, developmental psychology, yoga, meditation, stand-up comedy, and he has redefined the understanding and treatment of from both anxiety from scientific and humanistic perspectives. Much of his work is based on overcoming his lifelong battle with chronic crippling worrying, creating the award-winning and best-selling book, Anxiety Rx. He also has the Anxiety Rx podcast and more recently the MBRX, which is a self-study course that I highly recommend to anybody that is experiencing anxiety themselves or wants to learn more about somebody that they love going through anxiety. So it's a step-by-step -step program designed to permanently heal anxiety. Dr. Kennedy is empowering individuals from all over the world to overcome anxiety and embrace a life of calm and fulfillment. There is not a better guest that I can be excited about interviewing. Anxiety is something that has driven me my whole life, and I'm just so honored and humbled and excited that you're here today to join Thanks, You're Jackie. Welcome. I think that was probably the best introduction anyone's ever given me. So uh, I should just record that. <laughs> yes. I, I shared with you before we press record here that this is probably the most personal one that I've ever done. It's the most meaningful one to me. If there was one magic wand I had in the world to heal one thing, it would probably be this topic. So sure. for anyone who's listening to this, if you have anxiety, you're in probably the best company. And thank you for sharing what you're going to share today. You're welcome, Jackie. Just to quickly, so if someone's listening to this that doesn't know you so much, sure. my, my objective is definitely going to be to help as much as we can. How did you come to be the anxiety expert? I grew up with a parent, a uh, father with schizophrenia and bipolar. So I grew up in a lot of chaos and my father was never abusive or violent, but he was psychotic. So he definitely lost touch with reality. He would get deeply depressed. He would get manic where he'd stay up for four days and play the trumpet. And that was chaotic for a child. And so what happened with me is that I, I loved my dad so much, but I, I couldn't trust the love that I had for him because I didn't know if it was going to get um, pulled away from me at any moment by like psychosis. So it taught, it taught me that I can't trust love. And <clears throat> there really is only love and fear. So if you can't trust love, fear will begin to fill your life. And that's what happened with me. And then I'm, you know, highly 
driven like you are. So I became a doctor and a yoga teacher and a stand-up comic and an author and all that kind of stuff. But it, it never really seemed to um, assuage my anxiety for any length of time. It would help initially, but over, over time, the, the anxiety would always come back. So I found a way of understanding what anxiety truly is, which is basically old trauma that's stored in your body. And that's how you heal it. You heal it by going into the body, not so much the mind. And, and I feel like most traditional therapies try and change your mind, but it's kind of like, you know, don't think of a purple elephant. Well, you can't not, you know, you can't, it's just like, you can't stop worry by trying to worry less, like consciously, it just doesn't work. It just mm -hmm. gives you more anxiety. Do you remember the, do you remember the, the elastic band on the hand or on the wrist that they recommended long time ago oh yeah you know, just snap that band i'm like i'm gonna have welts that's not helping it at all it's just making my wrist hurt yep so that's i mean that's something that brings you into your body i think that's one of the reasons why you know tapping and that kind of stuff is the same kind of idea because anxiety is always about the future so if you can bring yourself into the sensation of your body in the present moment you've pulled yourself out of that future pain that that future worry and it trauma is also about the past. So, you know, trauma is about what happened to you in the past and worry is about what you project is going to happen to you in the future. And if you can get yourself into a place where you can feel your body in the present moment, you're kind of bringing yourself into a place where you can actually heal it instead of just coping with it. So amazing. I have so many questions. I can go from that spot. One of them is just sure. going to acknowledge in your program by the way, for everyone listening, he has this, that new self-study course. And in there you have sort of, I think it's 11 quick anxiety shifters yep. and it's not going to solve it, but there was one. And I, and I feel like I've done the EFT. I became a practitioner, sure. all of those things. And you've done it all, Jack. I, I have, and, and I did it all to an extreme degree that I was sure. going to prove everyone wrong that you can solve this. And it still was my, my driver. The one where you move your eyes side by side, like back and forth yep. this way. And yep. then also, this is the the best one that I've lovingly kept in my pocket probably every day since I did your course, which was the two sniffs in and a long exhale out. Yeah. Wonderful. And I yeah. know you have more for people to check out in there, but those are personally my two. Take it in my pocket. That really help. Go. Yeah. yeah. And I got those, both of those from Andrew Huberman. So it's like, I mean, I, I did a variation of it before. I used to have this one where I would do a, a variation on the physiological side, which is the quick two sniffs in and then the long exhale. For me, what I teach my anxiety people is to do three sniffs in, like really deep, really expand your chest, hold it at the top three or four seconds, and then close your teeth and breathe out through your teeth and make a hissing sound. And while you're making the hissing sound, you think of an overinflated tire like deflating. So it looks like this. So you go. And just try and elongate that exhale as long as you can. And I can't do this too many times or I'll start zoning <laughs> myself out. But that it really does help. So the physiological side is a quick one. But the longer one I find is more effective for people that really struggle with anxiety. Yeah, it it has really worked. I know that you want to do that. What does he call it? Yoga Nitra? Yoga Nitra meditation. is the meditation. Yeah. So basically what I, I believe is that anxiety really comes from a split from your adult self to your child self and from right. your mind and your body. So your child self holds your trauma, right? So it holds it. The body keeps the score. Bessel van der Kolk was right in his book. The body keeps the score. Any traumas that weren't resolved by an attuned, attached caregiver when you were younger go drop down from your conscious mind into your unconscious mind. And because the body is a representation of the unconscious mind, eventually that trauma will show up in your body. Now, we can use that part of your body when you feel a certain, when you feel anxiety to find that part in your body. So for me, it's in my solar plexus. Some people it's in their heart. Some people it's in their throat. And just put your hand over it and just connect with that because I do believe that that focus of alarm in your body is your younger self, is your scared child. So the adult in us doesn't want to go back to the child because the child holds all our pain okay. and the pain doesn't trust the adult because we've abandoned them for so long. A lot of us don't even know the child is there. And then this disconnect occurs and then it just creates more alarm in our system 
And just to go further with this, I think what happens when we're younger, we get an alarm that's too much for us to bear. Trauma, like divorce the parent, you know, abuse, sexual, emotional, physical abuse, that kind of stuff. And it gets stored in our body. And then that becomes a, a focus of our anxiety for the rest of our lives. So unless we heal the root cause of that anxiety in our body, that alarm in our body, we're always going to have the anxiety of the mind. The anxiety of the mind is really just a byproduct of this alarm that's been stored in our body. So if we fix the thoughts, it'll work temporarily. And this is true with like CBT and talk therapy, you know, fixing your thinking does help initially, but your overprotective ego always tends to drag you back to what's familiar and what was familiar in your childhood, you'll unconsciously replicate in your adulthood. So for me, it was chaos. So I replicated chaos in my early relationships, and which created a tremendous amount of anxiety. So it's finding the root cause in your body and treating that as well as treating your thoughts. I'm not against CBT or cognitive therapy. I just think that without adding the body component to it, you're going you're gonna to cope, but you're not going to heal. And there's so many people listening that can say that they they know they've had trauma and then yeah. so many people can say like no I didn't have any trauma but trauma from what from what I see for myself and, and a lot of other people it's really how you experience it so there could be yeah. a car accident and one person think that's nothing but another person can feel terrified and just lock it in differently yeah and typically the person that is terrified and locks it in differently had some trauma when they were younger same with combat PTSD so if you take 20 uh, soldiers in a firefight Five of them that show up with uh, combat PTSD are the most likely to have had trauma in their childhood. So a lot of people will say, I wasn't anxious until my car accident. I wasn't anxious until my divorce. But really, in the background, they kind of were. And that was just the, the triggering event that kind of opened it up. So, you know, most of this stuff, most of our brain development occurs, 80% of our brain development occurs before the age of five. So if we have attuned, detached parents before the age of five, it's really creating a lot of capacity and resilience in our nervous system for the rest of our lives. But if we don't, which is, I believe, most of us. <laughs> right. No shame in hearing that. Especially <laughs> these days, yeah. If we don't have that attuned, detached parent that we could kind of metabolize our trauma at the time, it winds up getting, you know, going into your unconscious, getting stored in your body. And then it it sort of triggers that anxiety reaction in your mind for the rest of your life until you realize that, oh, this is my younger self. Not that everything is trauma and everything is, oh my God, you have to fix your inner child, find your inner child, you know, but a lot of it is. I mean, I did therapy for 35 years, every type of therapy and nothing seemed to really work until I, I, you know, got into somatic therapy. I got into internal family systems. I found the younger version of myself and a bunch of them, like there's a bunch of children inside of me and it's showing them how that they're seen, heard, loved and protected now in a way that they weren't back then. And that's how you heal from anxiety, eating disorders, depression, OCD, uh, personality disorders, all this kind of stuff. It's all It all comes from basically unresolved childhood wounding, 98% of it. And do you think, like somebody's listening to that, one of the questions is why is there so much shame that comes with anxiety? I think ever a commonality between myself and everybody that I work with that has it, it's one of those things that's not, that comes with a lot of shame that you have yeah. it, that, that you don't want people to know that it's not good when somebody has it. Um, but do you think that there's just like, like a buildup of different traumas? You said that you have many different parts of yourself. So I'm yeah. guessing you can heal many different big yeah. traumas, little traumas. And when you start healing one, the others start falling like dominoes. That's the thing. When you start getting the real root cause and healing the real root cause, which is this alarm, which is this younger version of you, the other traumas just start falling like dominoes because they all, shame is one of the, shame is one of the glues that glues all our traumatized kids together. So I have a bullied part of me when I was, you know, at different points in school, I was bullied. Um, there's different parts of me, my dad being sick, that kind of thing. Um, all these things kind of amalgamate, you know, into your system. And it also depends on how sensitive of a child you are. Most people that I see with anxiety disorders were born sensitive. And I believe sensitivity and, and your temperament is kind of genetic. I think we do have this kind of, you know, a lot of people that I see or parents, they say uh, one kid who's very sensitive and the other kid is like, whatever, you know, 
And that's very true in my family, for sure. Uh, most of my family, extended family, they have um, one one of us who's one kid who's quite sensitive and the other kid's kind of like happy go lucky, like whatever. Like one of my uh, one of my cousins in Scotland, uh, she became like a, a lawyer. Then she became a doctor uh, and she did all these things like she was amazing. And she's very high strung. She's much like me. And then her brother, Colin, is very he's a skateboarder for Nike. Like he's just like, whatever, man. You know, yep. it's really funny to see in the same family, like two kids who are so different in sensitivity. One of my favorite quotes um, from Martini, he says, if two of you were the same, one's not necessary. So when we come into when we come into a family dynamic, we'll have everybody will like take their own traits and the other person will own the other traits so they can make like a whole whole family. And identical twins are like that, too. So they have the same genetic component. But if you look at identical twins, one tends to kind of take the lead and Mm -hmm. the other one takes the submissive. and, And that's how, you know, we have the same genetic component. But one tends to take the the more submissive and one takes the more dominant. And that's just how how we interact with with each other. Now, in couple relationships, that should switch back and forth between, you know, one person's more dominant at one point and one person's more submissive, because otherwise it starts creating this sort of unhealthy dynamic. But in identical twins, it works because they need a way of connecting with each other because they are so deeply connected at such a a fundamental level they need a way of interacting with each other right so if someone has trauma that they can't remember it's it's pre-verbal two years old three years old yeah Yeah. i guess my question to you is like can they heal like can they can they listen to this and even though they had horrific stuff can they heal that alarm yeah, I think I think you can. I think you you know maybe not completely, depending on the depth and and again the sensitivity of the person, but certainly you can live a better life. You can live a healthier, more um, calm, peaceful life. And we don't need to know the exact trauma. What we do need to know is where you feel that trauma in your body. I love so, how you taught people that it's on your midline. That was really helpful in your in your self-study course, because it's like, wait, it really is there. It'll usually go from like heart behind the heart, throat, stomach. Yeah. It really yeah. gets stored in that midline. And if you look at the emotional brain, you know, it's very central in the brain. So mm. it kind of reflects to the central axis of the body as well. So what I'll see in a lot of women who say had a narcissistic mom or a mom that was just very overbearing is this alarm held in their throat, like locked in their throat because they so badly wanted to tell their mother how they felt and express how they felt, but they couldn't. So that they hold their alarm in their throat and they have this younger version of themselves that just never was able to express themselves to their mother or their father. And then it gets stuck there. And then, you know, it becomes, you adapt to it. And a lot of times people become you know, with that kind of profile, become people pleasers. Because it's like, and you get very, very good at reading your parent, which I was because I had to watch my dad and make sure he wasn't going into depression or anxiety or, or mania or whatever. Um, You get very good at reading other people and giving them what they need. But as you do that, you slowly lose yourself. And as you lose yourself, it creates a tremendous amount of self reproach, shame, alarm, because there's this kid in you with their hands raised up saying, you know, what about me? What about me? And every time we keep pushing that kid away. So the kid's going to do two things. One is it's going to get louder. The alarm's going to get more intense or they're going to go into short shutdown and you're going to go into dissociation where you're not connected to your, your spouse, your kids, your parents, whatever. And it's not your fault because it's just the way we're wired. So we're wired for survival more than we are happiness. And if we have trauma when we're younger, when it's not resolved, we learn that life is about survival. But if before the age of five years old, especially if you grow up with a tuned, attached, loving parents, you learn that life is about connection. I learned that life was about survival and it took me probably 10 years to figure out, hey, this connection thing, as much as it's scary, it's the best way to live. What makes you think people, what makes people pick certain things? So if someone has trauma, one person goes this way, I more went like hypochondriac. Yeah. obsessive about my health, looking constantly for like, you know, had to clean things, looked out for things. And so 
I had a lot of um, clients and friends and that kind of stuff. My hairdresser being one of them was like, ask him this, ask him this. And one of them is like, she's like, I'm just doing the dishes. Everything's fine. And then all of a sudden I'll feel this overwhelming thing of anxiety yeah. or Danielle. She promised, I promised her I was going to ask you this. Sure. She can drive all the time. And now she's like, I can't drive alone anymore. Right. I literally get like white knuckled panic. And she's like, I just start yelling at myself. Like, what are you afraid of? Stop it. You've done yeah. this a thousand times. Why, what makes someone choose? Like one person goes agoraphobic, one person goes, what you said, disassociated. Is there yeah, a what, pattern? It depends. I mean, it's a combination of kind of nature versus nurture. Like what were your, because I had a sick parent. So I kind of fell into hypochondriasis because, so we are like, when we're kids, we're just feeling structures and you see kids like they just, you know, break down into tears for no reason. You know, it's like, that's, kind of the human condition in a way. Now we learn how to sort of civilize ourselves as we get older and that kind of thing. But it is one of those things that if you're, you know, if you're born sensitive, you will feel everything. And you, you've done a ton of work. I can tell, you know, because <laughs> Demartini, Donnie Epstein, you know, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of variation in, in, in the stuff that you're, that you're learning. And I'm honored that you're following me as well. So um, no, so let's go back to those questions you said yeah. of the, your hairdresser and whatever, because I had answers yeah. for those. I just yep. got side yep. So she, she's the driving one. She's having a really difficult driving alone. She's like, I used to drive to right. you know, Lake George an hour by myself. And she can't right. drive 10 minutes without having anxiety, without a real thought. That's, that's right. the interesting part. I know what that experience is like, but I'm so curious as to what is that or what's Yeah, that? I would get her to track it in her body. You know, yep. so when you're, you know, getting in the car or approaching the car, or even thinking about the car, like scan your body, like in the midline, as you say, like, and just see if there's an area of energy there, you know, and some people it shows up as almost like a numbness. And this is the thing we're working with unconscious mind. So, you know, I've had people that have alarm that say it's burning hot and icy cold at the same time, which, you know, on a cognitive level doesn't make a lot of sense, but because it on the unconscious kind of dreamlike level, you can dream that you're flying. You can dream that you're a dragon. You can dream all these different things. So you can have these conflicting kind of things. So I would get her to find where she feels the alarm and call it alarm rather than anxiety. Yes. I love it. So that. it's finding the alarm and then putting your hand over it, connecting it. There's a number of different things, you know, tell her to get my MBRX program. It'll help. I you did. Know, it, you know, yeah. she told me that right as you were launching it the next day and I sent sure. her the link and I sent you sent the Mel Robbins podcast episode to her. But you know what I find is like certain people, they want to avoid. I will jump right in what you said. Like if there's yes. someone that says they yeah. can help me, I'm on the plane. That's your personality. Yeah. I'm there. But it's also like, even I told you prepping for this, it's like, ooh, when you start going near something that's uncomfortable, you start sure. sweating. And a lot of people avoid wanting to do what you just said, which is just go into it, feel it. Yes, and they're like, no, totally. no, I, I don't. But it's long, short term pain for long term gain is the well, it's the only way you're going to get past it, right? Like you can't think your way out of a feeling problem. Yeah. And a lot of people do. And that's the problem is that in in the society, we're kind of taught, okay, I'll go to therapy, I'll talk about my issues and stuff, which does help in the short term. But I was talking to my wife, Cynthia, like a couple of weeks ago. And um, she's also a somatic trauma therapist. So so she was noticing that the cognitive techniques seem to work initially and they help initially, but they don't seem to stick. And I think our, our overprotective ego that, that believes that, that hypervigilance and worry is keeping us safe stops that. But also, she says, the somatic piece, like going into the body, staying with it, maybe having somebody with you, like maybe your friend who's afraid to drive needs somebody um, not necessarily in the in the passenger seat, but with their in, in the living room, just like talking about it, connecting with their connecting with someone else, feeling safe with that connection. And then that safety translates into being able to go outside of your comfort zone kind of what's thing. In, what's interesting is she said if someone's in the car with her, she just doesn't have it. And then when she was driving to work, she's like, the thought that I knew you were going to be there, I didn't have it. So it was right. something around like that being alone or what I'm gathering is more just like, where's her safety person? It's not herself. Yeah. And sometimes it's just, it's a just like when situation too. So I've had people who are afraid to drive uh, because when they were younger, they got into a car accident or when they were younger, every time they got in the car, their father would yell at them 
So there is this operantly conditioned, this sort of conditioned stimulus in you. And then if your life gets stressful, these things start to bubble up to the surface, you know? So it's important to understand that, that we have to practice this. We can't just expect, okay, I'm going to get in the car and do some deep breaths or whatever. You got to practice this. And, and I say this quite a bit. It's like, I said, okay, Jackie, I'm going to take you to the basketball court in three months. And if you can make three out of 10 foul shots, I will give you $20 million. Are you going to start practicing foul shots the day before? No, you're going to be every freaking day. You're going to be out there. Right. It's the same thing with anxiety. You have to practice going into that alarm, breathing through it. You know, it's it's hard to tell in, in a podcast, but it's basically acclimatizing because Bessel van der Kolk in The Body Keeps the Score says this. It's like, we're not teaching people how to get rid of their anxiety. We're teaching them how to feel it and and be okay with it. Because what happens is that we feel it and then we go up into our heads and try and think our way out of a feeling problem, which is a never ending, like you're just never, your thoughts are never going to solve the problem. So, but your, your mind will tell you that it does. So you get trapped in your head and you work through your head over and over and over and there's no solution to it. But by the same token, when you go into your head, you do escape that pain in your body. So worry does serve a purpose for sure. But it's just like you're always delaying your healing because to heal from anxiety, you pretty much have to go into that feeling. Now, having someone with, have a somatic therapist or someone who's, who's good at IFS or, you know, this is what the psychedelics often do too, is they, they, they get people to kind of see their, their wholeness and their trueness and their realness. But I'm not, you know, psychedelics are kind of like hitting an ant with a sledgehammer, right? It's like, it's a, it's a pretty big deal. And usually when people ask me about, you know, because I did psychedelics and it was, it was, you know, it took me two years to get back to normal after that. It's like, do IFS or do somatic experiencing for a year. And then if you still feel like you need the psychedelics, then you can, you know, try that. Now, microdosing psilocybin might be an answer because it's relatively mild and that kind of thing, but still, it can still be pretty traumatizing for people. Because the thing about psychedelics is that they take away all your defense mechanisms and you experience your trauma full force. Now, there's a theory that says that once you experience your trauma full force and you, you've done it, that it eases off. And in some people, that's true. But in some people, it actually makes it worse. So, you know, you really, the psychedelics, ketamine, all that kind of stuff, um, they're not a panacea, for sure. They're, they're a tool that I think will be used more and more over the next, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But they're not a panacea. They're not a, a get out of jail free card by any means at all. You know, I love in your in your course where you had those two arrows of like thinking is just going to make the alarm louder. Right. So in the past several weeks since I've been catching it of that's right, I want to think my way out of this. Yeah. And when I say you're not allowed to think what you said there really grips on. It's like, no, but this is our habit. This is our pattern. You're not allowed not to think about it. I know so because there's a security yeah. in that hypervigilance. Like there's a, a familiarity in that worry. When you were a child, that's all you had was worry. That's all you had was to go into your head when you were yeah. a powerless child, but you're not a powerless child anymore. So it's like, you don't have to compulsively be hypervigilant and go into worry anymore because you have other skills that perhaps your brain doesn't like make you aware of, but that's what I'm, that's my job. That's what I'm here for. Yes. I cut my, I sliced my finger and had to go get it stitched up. And I was like, really calm because I, I can do all the things that you say and breathing and all that. Right. And then I got anxious because I was so overly calm. Right. Like, Why are you so calm? There's blood everywhere. Maybe something's wrong that you're not. And so I could hear it wanting yeah. to come up and I'm like, it's a finger, like relax. Yeah. But the relaxed and the calm, you know, some people say that they get, and I, you talked about this too, is like they get anxiety just when they're relaxed. Yes. Like if you get a massage, yeah. it'll give you a panic attack because your body's totally. like, I don't do that. Well, it wasn't safe for me. Like my perception as a child, and this is true for so many people, there was always this period of calm where my dad was fine and then he would go psychotic again. So what I was conditioned to think over the course of time, more unconsciously than consciously, was calmness is always, uh, is always crushed by some sort of pain. So what the child will do is they'll go, I'm going to keep myself vigilant because I know this pain is coming. 
So that's when it's, that's chapter 62 in the book is like when it's not safe to feel safe. And this is one of the things that, that really blocks your healing, because as you start to feel, you know, as you know, you work through the program and you work through the book and you start feeling safer and calmer, if being safe and calm as a child was a trigger, it's this catch 22 that, okay, I've got to, so you, you just basically have to teach yourself that yes, it's okay to feel okay. It's okay to feel calm. I know it's I know it's going to bring up my alarm and then slowly over the course of time it's kind of like this two steps forward one step back thing where you start trusting peace and trusting calm but it doesn't happen immediately right. like it's a it's and a lot of people will quit because you know their overprotective ego that taught them like I have to worry I have to be hyper vigilant I have to be obsessive goes into high alarm when we think I'm not, I don't have to do this anymore because the reason you develop the compulsions in the first place is because it gave you this sense of safety. So in a way, but it, it's actually just making you worse instead of better. So it's kind of teaching you that the, the habit that you learned is not helping you. It's making you worse. You know, you can kind of treat it like, okay, OCD, I know you're there to help me. I know you're trying to protect me. You know, but we're going to just practice feeling safe for a little while. And that's what I mean about the foul shots is like practice this stuff over and over and over again so that when you do get into a stressful time, you have some resilience and capacity in your nervous system to draw on so that you can allow yourself to feel safe. I'm thinking of this, of this time flying when it's like, I used to fly so much and I'm like, if the anxiety is not there, that's a bad thing. And so it's like almost like creating it because it's like, oh, wait, something might happen if you are calm. But if you are worried, you're going to catch it. And it's such a silly, a silly thing to look for because it's yeah. like, well, what happens if I just become calm? Then I'm not going to be prepared for. Well, you that's know, and Brene Brown talks about that, too. <laughs> yeah. She says, no matter how many times you practice that call from the school saying your kid's been hurt or whatever, it do it doesn't help you like yeah. but. But the mind will tell you that it does. And it's like the story that I tell in the book of, about Ulysses and the sirens when, you know, Siren Island, the, the sailors would drive, you know, I was going to say drive, <laughs> uh, uh, sail by the island. And there was these beautiful women who would sing and, you know, and, and the sailors would steer their ship onto the rocks going to these beautiful women. And then they would turn into monsters and kill them. And it's basically those are your thoughts. Like those are the anxious thoughts is that, you know, you have to just keep sailing by the anxious thoughts, <clears throat> but it's so seductive. Like those sirens, those thoughts are so seductive that if we're not consciously prepared, we will automatically just, you know, drive our boat onto the shore and, or you know, get killed. Have that thought that it's like, what is, what is gut and what is that thought? You know, yeah. sometimes it's, is that coming from fear? Is that coming from and Intuition. then discerning yeah. from both of those of which one, which one's speaking to me not to get in that elevator right now, you know? That's and how that. you tell is the alarm in your body. So that's, I've had this question quite a bit. It's like, how do you tell the difference between intuition and fear? You know, it's like, oh, I might have a heart attack, you know, when I'm older, my dad had a heart attack, whatever. Okay. Now what's your body doing? Is your body alarm? Well, yeah. So it's probably fear. But right. if you, if you have sort of an intuitive sense, cause I, you know, do a lot of my work intuitively as well. But if you have an intuitive sense and your body's calm, that's probably intuition. Not 100%, but that's probably intuition. If your body's alarmed and you have a thought uh, like an intuition or, or you know, a projection of the future, more than likely that's fear. Sometimes it's not, though. And that's the whole thing. That's the whole uh, human condition is sometimes we can't tell. But usually I'll tell people the, the way that you often tell the difference between your intuition and a fearful projection or worry of the future is how is your body feeling? If so your if body you're calm, is calm yeah. if your body's calm and you're getting this sort of intuition about, you know, a friend or whatever, that's probably intuition. But if your body's in deep alarm, that's probably fear. That's so interesting. You know, I, um, when you see these news reports and I'm on lots of mom's groups, I have lots of children sure. and you hear something and then you start thinking it's going to happen to you or can it happen to you? Or I know that's more of like the hypochondriac part of it, but it's just you know, this person got brain cancer and you're, you're talking to them. And then what was the symptom of slight headache? And even though it's a big thing down the yeah. road, it's like the next time you get a headache, you, you it, that passes your, passes your thought. And I call it almost like dialing it down of bringing myself back into the present. But is that just our brain being old and wanting to try and keep us alive? Of yeah. Why? I mean, we have stone age brains in a digital world too. And here's the thing. The other thing about worry is that 
worry makes the uncertain a little more certain. And if you have trauma as a child, or if you're a chronic worrier, you hate uncertainty more than anything. So like you said, okay, so I have a mild headache. Well, maybe that's a brain tumor. Now in your, you know, um, your dopamine system in your brain, that makes sense. That kind of adds up. It's like, okay, well, this person had it. I could have it. So it makes sense. So you get this dopamine hit from worry that it makes sense. You're on the right track, essentially. But that worry is horrible. So a few seconds later, you think, yes, but now I have cancer. So unconsciously, you get this, this positive hit from dopamine because you made the uncertain a little more certain because we worriers hate uncertainty more than anything. So that's why we worry is be, it basically makes the uncertain a little more certain. Mm -hmm. But when we believe the worry, it just cycles on itself, which is the definition of addiction, which is why worry is addictive because it, it gives us a short-term hit of pleasure because we feel like we've made sense of something, even though it's a worry, but long-term it's like, it's horrible. So, you know, it, so you have to keep worrying to kind of keep getting that hit of being safe, but what your worry is, is, is health. And if you have health anxiety, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is exactly what it is. There's almost a part of us that wants to have something wrong so that it makes sense. So it's a dopamine hit of why we do that. Yeah, almost like an because it, it of... makes the uncertain a little more certain. And because, you know, as traumatized or, or worried kids, we hate uncertainty more than anything else. That's why we worry. People say worry does nothing. Worry actually does quite a bit. It keeps you out of the alarm in your body, for one, keeps you up in your mm, head. Distracted. And it makes the uncertain a little more certain. So it's no wonder we get sucked into worry. You talked about that Instagram thing that you had and how it brought up like that uncertainty for you. Oh, what being you... banned? Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I totally get that as someone who's yeah. high achieving. I totally yeah, get when the sure. when the floor falls on, out from your, your feet. What do you do when things really become uncertain? So for the someone listening that yeah. really did have something, I got Lyme disease in 2016. Okay. Um, and to hear a doctor tell me you're in uncharted waters, we don't know how to help you was probably yeah. the worst thing you could ever tell someone with certainty needing anxiety. It's, absolutely. Um, yeah, but absolutely. for someone that has something real, they do get that phone call of their kid's been hurt at school. Right. What is something you or you're, you get Instagram banned, whatever right. it is that causes that flush? Yeah. What do you what do you do when you're hijacked? Like when you you're not in for anxiety, like when something really happens, you go to like 12, you get a something. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the amygdala has no sense of time. So when your amygdala gets triggered, if you if you experience something now that you experience, say, as a child, so say if you were bullied as a child and then, you know, you're getting, you know, bullied online or whatever as an adult that will trigger that same old thing and, and your amygdala will regress you back to, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old. So there's a couple of ways. One is that you go into your body, you, te you teach yourself that, look, I'm going to, I'm going to be aware of my triggers. I'm going to be aware of what happens initially when I start getting alarmed and I'm just going to go into my breath. I'm just going to put my hand over the place that I feel the alarm. I'm going to go into my breath. So that's the first step. And it's always the first step because your brain is paralyzed. The, the rational part of your brain, the thinking part of your brain gets paralyzed when you're in survival, when you're in alarm. So there's no point in trying to worry, you know, think your way out of worry anyway, because the wor the thinking part of your brain has been paralyzed by the worry. That's that's the, the thing. It's like the story that I often tell is like um, leeches, when they attach to your body and start sucking your blood. It's kind of gross, and I probably shouldn't tell this to someone with health anxiety. But, but <laughs> no, I'm whatever. good. I'm good. As long Basically, as it's not happening to me in the moment, exactly. I can hear okay. about it all. As long as you're not in the water, you're okay. <laughs> yep. But what leeches do is they secrete a local anesthetic in their little tentacles, so that you don't actually feel them going in until they. So it's this insidious thing with worry. So what you need to do is go into your body first, regain that prefrontal cortex that allows you to think clearly, and then. You know, when you're thinking clearly, like faith is like the biggest, you know, it's the biggest antidote. Someone te uh, texted me last night, their their boyfriend has been diagnosed with a brain tumor. It's like, what am I going to do? My anxiety is through the roof. It's like, well, this is the thing that you have to have faith with. You have to have faith that things are going to turn out okay. And then, like you said, you can point to the person who had the headache and the brain tumor, right? But it's really developing this sense of faith. And faith is a skill, just like self-compassion is a skill. And it doesn't necessarily have to be religious faith. 
You know, one of the things that people with anxiety do is they overestimate threat and underestimate their ability to deal with it. So when you cut your finger, you actually handled it brilliantly. So, you know, all your worry. If it was, if it was something yeah. scarier, you know, everyone's like, wow, there's a lot of blood. I'm Maybe. like, it's my finger. It's fine. Maybe. But when I have something that, I don't know, some, I, I once got my neck adjusted and lost balance and okay. my atlas was off. Ooh, yeah. just even no matter, no reassurance was going to help me. Yeah. And it was just, I had to just stay still. But it really, when I really dig deep into it with a lot of different like modalities and thoughts and meditation, it all comes down to death. You just have to surrender to like, if I die and I'm still okay. So it comes yeah. down to whether- Well, that's faith. That's really yeah. faith, Jackie. I mean, that's what it comes down to is like, you know, in, in Indian um, kind of folklore, uh, Yama, the god Yama is a joker and he's the god of death. Hmm. He's a big joke, right? So we get all, you know, hyped up about this and, and all anxiety is separation anxiety. All anxiety is based in separation of some kind. You know, Gordon Neufeld taught me that. And then I add on, uh, and it's basically separation from yourself. So when you get a trauma when you're younger, uh, you can't blame your parents because, you know, often sometimes they're actually the cause, like it was with me, they were the cause of my trauma. So you can't blame them. You have to blame yourself because they, you know, your parents are, you know, keeping you alive. So you blame yourself and you start creating these, what I call jabs, which you probably read about in my, in my book. So you start judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming yourself jabs. So when you start doing that, when you're a child, it starts to separate you, you know? So there's the part that there's the part of you that judges yourself. And there's a part that's judged inside of yourself. I don't like the part of me that, you know, has a facial tick. You know, I don't like the part of me that, uh, laughs, you know, uncontrollably uh, when I'm nervous. You know, I'm not saying I have that. I'm just saying that this, these are things people have told me. And it's like, when you start blaming yourself like that, you, you'll never get out of it. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's just, it forms this victim mentality. And it, one, probably the biggest factor in people that don't heal from anxiety is this victim mentality. Because I if you feel it. like you're a victim, you you don't have any agency and you need agency in the world. You know, you're an adult now. You need agency in the world to heal. So if you still think of yourself as a wounded child and you're that and you're in that victim state where you don't have any power, you are always going to stay in anxiety. There's no way out. I love what you said about you over you underestimate how strong yeah. you are and you overestimate like what's happening, which is remarkable you know i i often tell people anxiety people with anxiety are usually the strongest people yeah and they might be scared but it's like wow how did you handle that if it's anybody yeah. else i am your go-to like if you want yeah. something to happen it's me sure. it's me that you wanted to happen around and sure. i often laugh I'm like you had to pick me to have that experience but i'm calm in that sense if if it turns towards me i can i turn five really quick <laughs> like i yeah, don't but but yeah. but you make it through though jackie that's the thing yep. like, like i think that we believe that if something bad's going to happen that we're just going to collapse and often that's not the case you know really often amazing. we believe we're going to collapse but it doesn't actually occur and i think that's what i mean about you know we we yeah. overestimate threat and we underestimate our ability to handle it because when it does happen you know i remember when i used to work emergency as a doctor you know, I'd have some fairly significant things come in and I would just go completely like Zen. like, And I would just watch myself do all the things that I'm supposed to do, um, you know, and then I, I, I'd get off shift and I'd be like, how the hell did you handle that? Like, that was pretty intense. So I think that we have this strength in us. And one of the things that I talk about, I think in the book, too, I mentioned it is like we have to we anxious people have to raise our kids, go to school, you know, go get groceries, drive our cars, do what like everyone else does. But we have to do it with 100 pounds of fear on our back. So after a while, you know, you get pretty strong. But the funny, the ironic part of that is that we don't believe we're strong. I hope whoever's re listening to this right now really like takes that part in because that's the that's the hugest thing of you can have anxiety and it doesn't mean you're weak. It, in yeah. fact, it's it's really, really strong. There's people that can't handle level two anxiety that criticize people that have anxiety yeah. until until they experience it themselves and then they'll never put someone down That's with a, and anxiety. I hear that all the time. Again. I hear that all the time. People contact me and say, I, you know, I never had anxiety. I never knew how people felt. And then now it's like I have it. It's like, holy smoke. Some people in their 70s, you know, it's like they, they'll contact me. It's like, I've never had anxiety before. But what you describe is exactly how I'm feeling. And I can almost track back 
you know, to when they were six years old and they're 70 now, you know, and they were in a movie theater and, they, you know, someone exposed themselves to the, uh, you know, there's, there's, I mean, there's always trauma and there's always, you know, you can always point fingers at things and it may not actually be the underlying cause. But if you talk to people about their trauma uh, and they feel it in their body, like they, they really feel it, it's like, well, chances are you're on the right track. One of the things that I, I messaged you after in this part of your course was for parents listening to their child, what I took away from it was all my kids need when they experience something, what we would call trauma or something bad is that they just need to feel protected, supported and loved. And now yeah. it's like not preventing them from getting bumped and knocked in life. It's just, this is what I can do. Like what yeah. I can do is hopefully let you store less of an alarm than you would if I didn't. Yeah. And it's good that our kids get alarmed. It's good that they, they experience some traumas and that kind of stuff. And then we show them that they can work through them. You know, that's the thing is it's not, it's not the absence of trauma. It's just having trauma and then having a supportive figure, like a parent who helps you metabolize it. So you learn in the back of your mind, oh yeah, things can go to shit, but I can, I mean, I'm kids okay. wouldn't say that, but, but, but I'm still okay. And, yes. you know, I used to play this game with Leandra, Leandra, you know, Atlanta, my daughter, and uh, I was in med school, she's about four, and she would come into the room and yell out sea monster. And I would, being the aforementioned sea monster, jump up and chase <laughs> her around the house, like, like, and really scare the crap out of her. You know, I really enjoyed it because I was in the <laughs> middle of studying and she's like, ah, you know, like, so I would really scare her. But within about five minutes, I would pull her back onto the couch or whatever, and we'd have a nice cuddle. And I would, you know, allow her parasympathetic, her rest and digest nervous system to come back up. And I didn't know it back then, but what I was doing was I was teaching her, look, you can go in a high fight or flight, really high fight or flight. And then within five minutes, you can be right back down into relaxation again, which is something that if your trauma wasn't metabolized when you were younger by, by a caring parent or, or authority figure or whatever, you don't learn that. So you go up into trauma, you go up into sympathetic, you go up into fight or flight and you come down, but you come down really slowly. And then as you're coming down, if you get another fright, you'll go right back up to the same like 100% again. So it's really important to teach our kids that they can get into fight or flight, but we can return them back into a parasympathetic rest and digest state as well very quickly because that teaches their nervous system that yes, life is has traumas in it, but it's not the end of the world. Now, when you're a child and you have trauma and you don't have a parent and you don't have anyone to talk to, you don't have anyone to tell that trauma never shuts off. So you're always just kind of treading water with it. And that's the one that you would do your steps of going yes, back in that, absolutely. in that thing and finding where it is. I have to tell people it's like waves, you know, waves are just going to come. It's not about stopping the waves. It's just getting Slowly. really good at what you said is here's this big thing. And I think from, and what you, you know, said, and you know, that the thing, you know, it's going to go like that. There's something in, in neuroscience called the recency bias, which is basically how, how we feel now our brains project that we're going to feel this forever. So if we're anxious, we're going to project that we feel this forever. If we're yes. depressed. We're going to, and it's not accurate because it's not true, but in our minds, it certainly seems that way. So when we're in anxiety, it feels like this is how I'm going to feel through us and depression. This is where suicide comes from is because people feel like there's no way I'm ever getting out of this, which is not true. It's basically just a trick of your mind and the recency bias, but it can be pretty intense. Is that the same wavelength? Does it come from the same thing, people, for depression? The same kind of hidden I, I alarm think, and hidden trauma? Well, I think, yeah, as you were saying earlier, like why does some people show up with hypochondriasis and other people show up with like OCD or something like that? You know, so it's it's hard to tell why people go down a certain pathway, but the root cause is almost always the same. The root mm -hmm. cause is something happened to you when you were younger that you either kept to yourself because it was really shameful or you could, or you didn't have a supportive um, caregiver to talk to and metabolize, and that stay that system that stays in your system, and creates anxiety in your mind for the rest of your life until you go back into your body, find it, bring it up. And sometimes it's so intense you need someone else, like you need a therapist, you need a friend, you need someone that you can sort of move through this with. But because it's so couched in shame, as you talked earlier, we don't want to share that. So that that you know deep rooted shame alarm stays in there and not only does it stay in there we don't want to approach it if we don't approach it we never learn how to metabolize it or realize how many people like to me what you've accomplished and if you just read everything that you've done even stand-up comedy for someone that has anxiety to even like right you, you know just just everything putting yourself out there like this sharing your story all of it 
it's, it just shows like how anxiety isn't something to be ashamed of. Do you think everybody has it in some capacity? I think everyone has trauma to some extent and whether or not your parents, uh, metabolize it for you or not i think that makes a big deal. i think childhood is traumatic for everyone it's just if you have a parent that that uh, can help you metabolize but the curious thing you said earlier on is like my anxiety over going on stage before i open the curtain to do stand up is different than my chronic anxiety yes me too so it's yeah <laughs> so it's you know it is it's a it's a qualitatively different sense it's in a different place in my body it's a very different sense and it seems um surmountable you know, the, the, before I go on stage as a comedian, that seems surmountable. Um, and, and it's been practiced and that kind of stuff too, but the other anxiety, uh, it's fine now, but you know, five or 10 years ago when it was really bad, um, it seemed completely uh, insurmountable. Like it seemed like there's no way, but there was a difference between, because I could be horribly anxious during the day. And I used, I tell this story uh, before I was like, I'd wake up at like seven or eight in the morning, knowing I had a, a shift in the clinic that day as a doctor petrified saying there's no way that i can do stand-up tonight like there's no i just way too anxious and then by the time eight or nine comes around it's like no i'm looking forward to it you're strong so again just, yes it just, yeah it just shows you how how mercurial like anxiety is and how much of a lie that it's telling you but we want to believe it because again going back to what we were saying earlier anxiety is a way of of minimizing uncertainty but it's a way of minimizing uncertainty that comes at a huge cost Yes. Keeps you, keeps you thin. No, keeps you. Well, it does in a way. Yeah. You know, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you want to share with people listening about anxiety and just even about your course and just how possible it is? I, I mean, I think I, I would share two things. One is when you're freaking out, just ask yourself, am I safe in this moment? I know I'm freaking out about something that might happen in a week, a month, a year, whatever. But in this moment that I'm in right now, and this works really well in the middle of the night, in this moment that I'm in right now, am I safe? And I look around, it's like, yeah, you know, it's almost begrudging. It's like, yeah, I'm safe, whatever. You know, it's like, it's really understanding that am I safe in this moment? The second thing that I would tell people is when you get anxious, or I, I prefer the term alarmed, get out of your head, get into your body. And even though it's uncomfortable, like put your hand over that area that feels uncomfortable, breathe into it. Smell an essential oil that, you know, carry that around with you, like lavender, chamomile, something like that. Because smell is a sense that goes immediately into the emotional part of our brain. It isn't pre-processed by any other part of the brain. So it goes right into the, the emotional brain. And start going into your body rather than staying in your head because there's no answer in your head. So it's two things. Am I safe in this moment is really important. And then when you're feeling alarmed, stay in your body. Don't go into your head because your head is just going to make it worse. You know, and I talk about that in the book, Anxiety Rx. I talk about all this stuff in my program, Mind Body uh, Prescription. You know, it's really about practice. You can't just expect your anxiety to go away because you've had your anxiety for 5, 10, 15, 20, sometimes 50 years. So it takes practice. It takes practice and your ego, and I talk about this in, in the program as well, your ego is always going to try and sabotage you back to the familiar, which is hypervigilance and worry. So what you have to do is just keep going and keep going and you will break through. It, it does break through. It's a false wall. Like anxiety always tells you that you need to be worried to be safe when it's the opposite, you know, and you really have to be able to kind of keep going, keep practicing, stick with it because it does, There there is life on the other side anxiety is not a life sentence so if you want to if you need to if you want to find me it's the anxiety md not the anxiety doctor the anxiety md that's all my stuff if you google that you'll find my instagram my twitter my my website is called the same thing <laughs> all the that's things. the easiest way to find me for sure and, and i'm committed it... i'm committed to making things affordable i like i have a hard time with the business of trauma you know i have a hard time with the fact that therapy is 150 dollars an hour and you're going to need at least 20 to 50 sessions of therapy. So that's thousands and thousands of dollars. So that's why I like creating stuff that that's that's affordable, that provides you with really good information and practical stuff that you like meditation stuff that you can use that will help you right away as opposed to sort of, and there's nothing wrong with therapy. If you can afford it and you've got the time, by all means, it's very effective. But for me, I just feel really bad for people that can't afford it and they're suffering and I, I i don't want people to suffer with anxiety the way that i did 
You know, when you, when your course came out and it said $97 and the first thing that I thought was you really care about people having this. It it's was actually a hundred dollars. I, 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 oh, I'm really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I'm really, I'm really kind of against the whole $97 oh, okay. and 997, 1997. Right. Like that's one of the things, like, that's why I get all worked up about the business yeah. of trauma. Like, <laughs> like psychologically, yes, $99 looks better than a hundred, but yep. I think on some level, like I put out something about four or five months ago that was free. It was a meditation, a hypno meditation that I make upstairs in my, in my studio which is also called my wife's walk-in closet. And, <laughs> and uh, I made it in my studio. I put it for free. About 900 people downloaded it and about 87 people actually did it. I put out um, MBRX and almost a thousand people have, have downloaded. It's like 987 as of today. And not that I check every day, but I do. And uh, it's, it's, but everybody who buys it for a hundred bucks, even though it's, okay. you know, everybody does it. Right. So there's something about that. There's something about when you have skin in the game, when you actually have something. And that's why I didn't want to charge like five ninety seven or four ninety seven. It's a hundred bucks. And if you want to pay in two installments, it's two installments of fifty bucks, you know, or or three installments of thirty four dollars. Right. Like it's not I'm not trying to make money off of off of this. I'm trying to get my my word out to as many people as I possibly can. And there is, there's, there's works with a major publisher right now who wants to buy the worldwide rights to my book, which would really help get it out there into the hands of so many more people. So I'm, I'm working with that right now. And that's what I'm going to be working with the next couple of weeks. So things are really moving, you know, and it comes things back really to you. Moving. That's the yeah. thing. It's like, you're putting good out there, whether it's a hundred dollars or, you know, it's, yeah. it's different. There's a different energy to it. Um, yeah. You know what I love about your course, just for everyone listening to that, sure. why people are completing it. I think anyway, anxiety people like to accomplish things. We don't yes. like to feel overwhelmed. And the yeah. eight minute videos gives me yep. the whole little thing. It's like, I can do a nine more minute video and I have yep. all the kids and all the business and all the things. Yep. And that's what it is. Every step you feel like you're accomplishing something and even your meditation, some of them's like 20 yep. minutes. If you don't have 20 yep. minutes to heal your anxiety, then you just might not want to yet. And that's okay. <laughs> and that's true. And, and, you know, you may not be ready and there are people that aren't ready, that, that, you know, maybe ready in five or 10 years They go, Oh, I remember what he said. It's like, okay, well, I'll start doing it now. And that's yeah. the reason I wrote this book yeah. in 108 chapters, because some of the chapters are just a page long. So for people with anxiety, you feel like you're actually getting through it the does. book, you yeah. know? So when you read a book and it's like 47, okay, 48, 49, yep. 50, you know, so that, and that's not done by accident. And the other thing about the book is it, it's quite repetitive because I can get into your conscious mind right away, but it's your unconscious mind that actually holds the root of your anxiety. And that's why, that's why there's repetition. That's why it keeps getting, so people that, that sort of criticize the book say, well, it's repetitive. And I, you know, I want to yell at them like through yeah. the Amazon, you know, thing. it's like, I, yeah. I wrote it that way for a reason. And when I do the new edition of it, I'm going to put in the very front, this will feel repetitive. And yeah. it's supposed to, because I'm trying to get into the unconscious part of your brain Rather than the conscious, the conscious, I can change your mind in like 30 seconds, but the unconscious is where most of the anxiety, the root of anxiety and alarm is held. And that's where we have to fix, you know, and that's why I say, you know, the cognitive stuff works immediately, but it doesn't last. But the, the unconscious stuff takes a while, but it actually allows you to like live a better life. I think it's like seven times is like when you when you fully digest it or something. There's what a I lot of different theories about yeah. it. And it depends on how emotionally laden it is too, Jackie. Like if there's something that's really powerful, you know, like if you were physically abused as a child and there's stuff in on physical, it may take a hundred times before you yes. actually yeah. can, can break through that. That so beginning part, the beginning part of your book, it makes your heart race. Even, even yeah. I was reading it uh, like a little book club of a few of us. And it's like, all of us were like, whoo, it's increasing anxiety yeah. a little bit, but I think it's because it's getting to yeah. that. So, um, somebody read it ahead that does, yeah. didn't have kids. And she's like, just wait till you get to this chapter. It's yeah. all gonna, it's all gonna yeah. come, but makes it's, sense. it's your speaking to that. I, I always say yeah. repetition equals mastery. So yeah. just tell people if you really want to master something you're not going to hear it once. I'm going to tell it to you 50 times until you know what I'm going to say. And then I know you have it. And your ego will resist it. That's the thing. Like your ego, I have to see, keep penetrating your ego because if I don't, your ego will just sabotage you back into hypervigilance and worry every single time. And that's why, you know, most people are in therapies, different therapies. They've read all the books, they've done all that sort of stuff. And they've done it for 20 years and it still hasn't really helped them. 
So it's, it's, it's getting into that, those unconscious roots. And we do that with repetition and practice. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome.